I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Roger Nelson, the founder and director of the Global Consciousness Project. He studied physics at the University of Rochester, experimental psychology at New York University in Columbia, and is the author or co-author of 75 technical papers and two books. Roger was a professor of psychology at Johnson State College in Northern Vermont and later joined the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab to coordinate research. He created the Global Consciousness Project in 1997 and is a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. So, Roger, welcome. It is a true pleasure and absolute honor to be able to interview you. Now, from what I've read, the Global Consciousness Project is a long-running experiment to detect interactions of consciousness with physical systems by detecting a change in the output of random number generators that correlates with major news events. Is that a fairly accurate description? And can you walk us through it in a bit more detail? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, the detail begins way early. Uh, when I joined the Pair Lab in 1980, we were just developing random event generator technology. <clears throat> by the early 90s, we were ready to, by, because we'd been doing miniaturization, we sort of go along with all the computer miniaturization. We were working on going out into the field with these random number generators to see if group consciousness would have any effect on them. We had already shown that an individual trying to change the behavior of one of these devices could do so. Not very much, and not all the time, but on, on average, a little bit above expectation, so that over the long run, it was very, it's very strong statistical evidence that what we think matters in the world, in the material world. So the uh, field experiments, we took uh, these, one of these devices miniaturized to things like really fabulous concerts where everybody's like pulled together and joined um, <clears throat> at the ears. <laughs> and um, we predicted that if people really became coherent, resonant with each other, became a real group, um, that the data would uh, kind of recognize that by joining the group, you might say. And, um, that that um, we found that if people were doing rituals, if they went to some kind of a, you know cathedral if, and joined in the massive Christmas whatever it was, uh, if people went into the woods uh, to do pagan kind of rituals, but also things like opera, uh, really good meetings, we would we took. Uh, these devices to all kinds of different situations. If you have a really good meeting, you know it. You, you don't know it at the time, you're just in it. But then you look reflected, uh, reflectively on that meeting and you say, wow, we really were, you know, we really came together. So um, that, um, that set of experiments, which we call field RNG experiments, thinking in both we were um, going out into the field, and also we were <laughs> looking for evidence of, of a consciousness field and ultimately finding it. So that led to the larger question, what happens if you have multiple uh, random number generators? What happens if they're far away? And um, what about a really big group, like the whole population of the planet? <laughs> Naturally, of course, we never have all, everybody uh, join uh, at one time in the great group consciousness, Earth consciousness. But really large numbers of people do sometimes um, come together in a coherent way because they are uh, trying to do something like a mass meditation or uh, demonstrations for peace, but also because of emergencies, uh, accidents, uh, terrorist attacks, those kinds of things natural disasters. <clears throat> so we uh, hypothesized that this uh, giant group would also have consciousness um, of which we, uh, in which we partake, uh, but it's different. We don't recognize it. We're a little like neurons in the brain. 
you know, the neurons might not know really much about our awareness, you know, the consciousness that we have, but they are intrinsically a part of it. They are necessary parts of it. And I think in some sense, we human beings may be like that. We're intrinsic parts of something much greater than we individually know or even imagine. So that's the kind of lead up to the Global Consciousness Project. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, that's a wonderful way to visualize, I guess, human consciousness, you know, is that each person is like a neuron in something much larger. So I, I wanted to ask about the random number generators, because these are, uh, they're controlled by reverse biased Zener diode, which mm -hmm. relies on quantum tunneling. So in other words, it sounds like GCP itself is measuring the influence of consciousness on quantum systems. So I, I'm wondering, is this connected to the observer effect or to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Uh, wow. It's possibly connected to those um, remarkable insights of the early uh, giants in physics, um, but also some later ones like the entanglement uh, that mm -hmm. Einstein uh, talked about with <laughs> Podolsky and Rose. Um, they're um, all, all the time physics group is growing. It still is. I mean, it's not a finished project, but those were steps along the way to discovering how much we don't know, how much of the world there is that we cannot actually directly perceive. Uh, we can hypothesize and, and fantasize, uh, but we can't see things like uh, electrons. We can only see their effects. So yes, in that random number generator, we use, um, we set up a circuit that's pushing electrons against the switch. The switch is off. And uh, so the electrons should not flow. But because of this quantum indeterminacy, where is it? Or uh, in the Heisenberg principles says there's a kind of uncertainty. Um, and sometimes that uncertainty allows it to be on the other side of the barrier. The electron, it acts as if an electron passes through a territory that's forbidden. It can't be in that uh, switch territory, but it gets on, it comes through to the other side somehow. And that we measure the voltage created by those um, remarkable escaping electrons. <laughs> and it's tiny, but it's also completely random. So we amplify it enough, we can actually sample it. And if it's um, high voltage, we call it a one, it's a low voltage, we call it a zero. So it's it's definitely a quantum indeterminate process. Nobody knows when it will happen. That means it's unpredictable. Nobody knows how many uh, electrons might actually flow in any given amount of time and so forth. So um, the principles of indeterminacy and probably also entanglement already come into play. Yeah. Well, the thing that intrigued me about that, and this is a little bit off my questions list, but, you know, there's been this debate back and forth, right, about um, definitely consciousness or what some people might call psychic powers, things along those lines. And I, I think the popular media um, has definitely grouped this in with quantum mechanics, right? For obvious reasons, you've got stuff like non-locality at play and, you know, the, this this randomness to it. Um, so it seems very fashionable in today's world to do that. And science, I think, has pushed back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's, there's not necessarily a correlation here. But what intrigues me about this is um, you're measuring exactly that. This is the effect of quantum, uh, this is the effect of consciousness on a quantum system, right? And so in a way that seems to support, I guess, this, this growing popular idea that whatever these effects of mind are, they seem to be quantum in nature. I, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, they're not necessarily very, um, you know, elegantly formed thoughts, but I, um, even though I'm not a theorist, I theorize and nevertheless, and I kind of think that what we are looking at is a world in, that isn't separated into me and you and electrons and protons. It's all kind of like a unified whole 
as somebody like David Bohm would say, it, there is a wholeness about it. And everything that happens is kind of whole of movement. That is some, something, some patterns are changing, uh, moving. Uh, the world is shifting within a, a, a massive uh, conglomeration of everything. So, yeah, um, I think consciousness is fundamentally misunderstood <laughs> by most of us. We sort of think, ah, oh, the brain is flip, flick, flexing its muscles and becoming, and so we get consciousness that spurts out uh, as if it were, you know, a bag filled with water and you poke the hole in it, so consciousness comes out. But it's, um, I think it, it's possible it's almost the other way around. That consciousness exists already in a, a universal form, cosmic form, and we are manifestations of that sort of little individual um, outbreaks of, of mm -hmm. something that uh, humans think of as awareness, and, but all arising out of this cosmic background. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let me let me go into the network itself. Because again, you've been collecting data on the website. It said fifteen years, and I think I think that hadn't been updated in a while. Because <laughs> you've got to have like twenty five years of data now, and it, then up to seventy random number generators located at places all over the world, right? And yeah. you've also done correlations against hundreds, potentially thousands of global news headlines. And I will put links to the website up here because, you know, you've, you've detailed data for these as well. I mean, this isn't just a claim. This is, you've got actual data and variances and statistical information for all of these events going down right. here. So, yeah. um, so it, I guess after analysis by dozens of scientists on this project, are you confident that this experiment is successful in measuring a change in device output based on human consciousness? Yes. Um, we have a, a rigorous protocol that we define an event, the beginning of it, the end of it. We know the dimensions altogether. And we define ahead of time the analysis that we will apply to the data that we extract from the database, which is archived, you know, uh, that corresponds to the event of period. So that's the protocol for it's actually 500 um, formal events. And it was um, that started in 1998, late 1998, and continued until 2015, December. So 17 years and 500 events that constituted what we call, I call the formal <laughs> experiment, completely uh, a priori uh, registered uh, analysis and basically unimpeachable data showing ultimately if you, you know, add up all the small deviations and was, some of which are backwards, some of which did not conform or confirm the hypothesis, but it gradually, if you add them up, they they become extremely impressive. We have a an effect size of one third of the standard deviation. That's not enough uh, for to be even close to significant if you have only one. But if you have five hundred, it becomes um, in the physics terminology a seven sigma departure from expectation. That's seven standard deviations. It's so far out in the tail that uh, it has to be recognized as a as a real effect. So uh, the statistics are sound. Um, the data are continuing to be accumulated in this project, um, just because I love the network and, and the people who are you know volunteers managing and maintaining these what we call eggs, the random number generators out in the field. For years and years, well, 20, 25 years. Anyway, that's still running, but we're not doing formal. The formal experiment is over. Um, I do explorations if something happens like, uh, you know, a major election or terror, a war breaks out like in, in Ukraine or the, um, the, 
something like the pandemic is declared. You know, I look at the data on the on these on these moments, and it's informal. It's not a pre-registered, super rigorous kind of thing. But it's just asking the network, what do you think? Yeah. So the measure that we actually use as a standard measure almost all the time, we call a network variance. It's a the variability across all of the devices in the network in one second, and then the next second. So there's this uh, standardized uh, quality or quantity that represents the, you know, varying activity of the 70 or however many eggs there are in one second. And then we can add up those seconds uh, to constitute six hours or whatever the length of the event is. We've said. And the very interesting thing is that that measure, which we call a variance measure, actually also is a correlation measure. It measures the correlation between these devices. They may be separated by a thousand miles, and they're designed to be completely independent, they're, and they're good at that. <laughs> but during one of these events, when human consciousness is sort of spread out over the world in some powerful feel like matter, the, 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 uh, these devices become correlated. It, it's as, I think I said something else about the field experiment. It's as if these devices become part of the consciousness. Ah, well, and you know, I, I wanted to ask about that. Let me ask now, it's further down on my questions list, but one of the things I'd wondered about was if you could learn more about specifically how these effects are happening, by things like, um, for instance, with an event like September 11th, right? It hits the news, but different population groups are awake in different areas, you know? And so the event itself may happen at you know, 9 a.m. Pacific time, but people in the East Coast may be more in a position to learn about it. People in the West Coast may be a little slower. And then people in Asia aren't even going to hear about it until they wake up, right? And so one of the things I'd wondered was um, when when the, the eggs, when the detectors start to detect these, do they do it all at once simultaneously? Or do you see kind of a roll, uh, you know, kind of a rolling event, I guess? I think the answer, um, I haven't asked, you know, the form, in a formal way, I haven't done that kind of analysis, but the correlation, I'm saying, during, within the space of one second, these devices that are separated, you know, they may be in Africa or maybe in California or maybe in Japan, they correlate with each other. Mm -hmm. That means the effect is happening then, now, <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> it really doesn't matter. That uh, conscious that not everybody is awake and conscious, and or paying attention, or even knows about it. The global consciousness comprised of all of us. If you know, I'm going out a bit out on a limb to say the global consciousness, as if it really exists. I think it does. I think there's really good evidence that there's something like it um, that's real and it actually has effects. And so it. The global consciousness has uh, its timing. It seems to be linked very much to uh, to the, the the event itself. So, um, I mean, the event happens at a real time. I do all the data collection. All the archive uh, data are stored in uh, UTC or Greenwich Mean Time. So there's never any confusion about when the departure from expectation begins. It happens at a certain point in time, and I might be asleep, and Europe might be awake, um, but but it's um, you know the, the the timing of the event is really in global terms or in its own terms, I guess you would say. Mm. So I think the global the evidence points toward the global consciousness, this hypothesized entity, which isn't just individuals in various places. It it's like a brain. <laughs> It's like a mind of its own, and it, it's paying attention real time. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, it's absolutely amazing. One of the reasons that I, uh, you know, again, I, I come back to global consciousness every few years. And every time I do, I get so incredibly excited. And part of that is my own background, right, coming from the tech industry and stuff. Um, you know, we, we love to see data. And in your case, there is so much data and it's quality data and it's rigorous data right and so I, I actually i wanted to address the concerns that some of the critics have had about what what they describe as cherry picking data to support experimental goals uh dr dean radden actually just published a paper entitled anomalous entropic effects and physical systems associated with collective consciousness and i'll put a link in there because no one's going to remember yeah. that but um <laughs> What what he showed was a measurable effect at all times, not just during major news events, right? Do you think that that effectively satisfies the, the critics' concerns? Well, the critics are pretty hard-headed, uh, which in a way means something like they don't absorb information very well. But, um, you know, the serious ones, the people who actually pay attention to the data, don't, they know very well that they're not cherry-picking because they have, as you have, they've looked at the uh, description, they've looked at the database and so forth. And by the way, the database is always available for anybody who wants to analyze it mm. uh, using whatever methods. That's why uh, uh, my friend Dean uh, was is able to um, publish a paper like that, which I love. And I think it does go a long way. There's... I'm writing a paper at the moment, which um, which has, in addition to the original stuff and the kind of advanced analysis of the original uh, database, it has three other parts. One of them is Dean Raven's um, uh, multi-scale entropy, and he's got two or three uh, other kinds of things in the same paper um, that all point to the idea or the what we might believe is a fact, because it's becoming very well established, is that there's something happening that's, that's probably related to human consciousness to change the behavior of random number devices so that they become less random. That's what this neg entropy, what the multi-scale entropy uh, pro program uh, and analysis scheme has been doing. That's what it says. The data should be utterly random. They are. In a, from when you just test the devices, but because of uh, the fact that we're in a world this, that's in, um, encased and in, embroiled in consciousness, that um, truly random data becomes slightly less uh, random. The neg entropy is widely spread. It isn't uh, just generally, it isn't just a constant lowering, the little chunks of Neg entropy that appear all over the place, not only in the events uh, that we look at. Second, one of those three things is a guy, in, uh, an economist in Sweden. His name is Ulf Holmberg. If you look him up um, and look at some recent papers there about how how the stock market uh, predictions that uh, somebody with the kind of modeling, uh, economic modeling that he does. Um, the GCP data can be used to improve the models enough to increase their usefulness or predict their predictive ability by something like three or four percent. That's non-trivial, and uh, the sort of thing that uh, Wolf is running a, a model at the present time. It will run for a full year, and in August we will find out how much money uh, the model would have made if it had had real money invested in just very recently talked to them um, in a little group, which, by the way, I have to tell you about the GCP 2.0. Don't let me forget to do that. Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to that, definitely. Wolf is, Wolf is part of the group that's working on that. Anyway, uh, somebody uh, asked, um, what about the turmoil in the markets recently? How does that, how does that look to your modeling using GCP data? And he said, you're still better off using GCP data. Even, you know, you won't lose as much if you're losing and you will gain more if you're winning. 
So, and then the third part is stuff that I've been doing myself, which is to look at the data in a different way. The raw data are just a mess. You know, it's like completely un pattern-free wildness. And that's what random data look like and they should look like. But if you start doing mm, what the neurophysiology types do, which is um, epoch uh, additions, you, you take um, a moment that might be like another moment in in principle and stack it, stack it, and add them all up, add a whole bunch of them up. That's called signal averaging or epoch averaging. And then do a little smoothing and, and you wind up with seeing that there is, after all, a pattern in the data um, that relates to the predictions that are made in the formal experiment. So if, if I'm uh, just drawing a picture, I've got a line that goes along like this, and, and normally it's just random, doesn't have any bad pattern. But if I put all the significant events of a certain size uh, together as an epoch average, and do this, I get a drop and then a big peak and a down and a back in again. And that is what a brain wave EEG pattern looks like if you flash a light in somebody's eyes. If you make a big sound, a, you know, bang a pot next to somebody's ear, you will get this kind of pattern. So I'm myself fairly convinced that this means that what we're looking at is a stimulus response event. The global consciousness, the big one, that comprise of all of us, even though we don't know it, <laughs> that's um, responding to stimuli from the world um, and in a, in a very, in a fashion that's so, so like the evoked response in brain research that you couldn't, you can't tell that one graph from another. It has the same high peak uh, with a low peak of the opposite sign on, on both, both before and after. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, absolutely incredible. So in, in this, I mean, in this model, human minds, even though they are composed of neurons, they are something, they're part of something larger and act as neurons in that. Mm -hmm. And that's the global consciousness. Yeah. Now, one thing that occurred to me was, um, well, I, I guess there are a couple of kind of corollaries to this, right? Like, so people aren't concentrating on the egg devices specifically. These are just kind of in the background, right? They're picking stuff up. They're different locations. No one knows where they are or what they're doing. No one is thinking about them. And yet they respond to this global consciousness. So it occurred to me that not only are people influencing each other, right? But we're probably influencing every quantum system on Earth to some degree. All I can say is, yeah, <laughs> that's got to be right. It, right. Uh, I mean, it basically is saying something like I did a little while ago. We're all connected. We're all part of this huge cosmic uh, consciousness. And so um, what you do and what I do, are they're, these are not isolated doings. They are part of the, of the whole. And I think that uh, we need as, you know, the message I personally take away from the Global Consciousness Project, this experiment, which is technically interesting and all kinds of wonderful, but the message is something like, what about us, you know? Are we... Um, going to survive on this planet uh, my I'm, I'm getting I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm straying from the message the message is that we are connected and we really really need to it's an unconscious connection we need to make it conscious we need to try everything we can think of to recognize that we are connected at a deep level and uh, forgive ourselves for being unaware of that and try to become aware of it and help each other become aware of the connection that we share and which we need so desperately. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I think, sailing against the wind. Um, at, at least that's what it looked like if you watch the news or listen to uh, my son, who's uh, 
yeah, he's been uh, for years reading uh, and talking about the sort of the catastrophic literature, the end of what he lent me a book, um, the limits to growth. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And that's only a mild version of some some of that stuff. Well, there are a lot of people who think, you know, that it's going and it's not going to be slow. It's going to be very soon a really terrible uh, mess on the planet. I mean, we're hurting the planet. We're hurting each other, and we won't recognize it, and we must. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm always hopeful that people like you. We have an audience, and uh, you bring um, some positive, optimistic news to people. Uh, but we need that desperately, and we need to act on these. I, here's here's one way I think of it: the data from an experiment like the GCP show that we are all uh, connected, and this means a couple of things. One is that. Um, we we have uh, a potential. We have a potential. There's something along the lines that the people who talk about conscious evolution are talking about. We have the potential to change ourselves and all of our interactions with each other in such a way as to become, to consciously evolve, to become better than we are, to become the next stage of what we are supposed to be, be which um, for, you know, all the sages of uh, every culture have always said we are so we are one. Um, right now, we're in a, a cultural era where there's a tremendous drumbeat of saying of individuality and me first, and don't take my AR-15 away from me, and so on. And we are uh, that's um, going to be the death of us <laughs> if we don't learn some, you know very easy kind of lessons about loving each other, about feeling compassion, about feeling um, you know, this kind of uh, interpersonal connection instead of the inter interpersonal fear that is being drummed into us by parts of the, you know, the, the, the culture. Oh my. <laughs> well, so I, you know, I had a couple of other types of events I wanted to ask about, actually. Two two came to mind, and I'm sure that in the data you have probably seen, well, the first one you've probably seen a million times, but I wondered, do you think it might be possible to baseline some of these events against something like Christmas? And I know that sounds odd, but I thought, you know, I was like, what what's a regularly occurring event where you would expect to see a spike and i thought christmas every year right yeah. i mean i thought could you use and i'm sure that there are others but christmas is is that's probably the most global even though it's become rather secular right it, in a secular basis I that a number of other religions that would say well all right yeah <laughs> but i i thought you one, know that there's one very close to christmas that uh, that has uh, the almost unassailable characteristics of the sort you're talking about. New Year's. Oh, New Year's. Yeah, New Year's. I was thinking of that as well. Uh, and there are some other New Year's, but you know, like the Chinese have as, as New Year's. Um, but they celebrate. You go, you look at Hong Kong or Shanghai or whatever, they're doing a major fireworks and all that, you know, wonderful gathering um, on December 31st. <laughs> In other words, the whole world joins in that. Yeah. We have looked at every New Year since the pro program began. And they have, uh, we make two predictions. One has to do with the uh, measure I talked about before, this uh, it's kind of like a mean shift, you might say. And the other one is variance, which I also talked about a little bit. And what we predict and have seen in many of the New Year's, not all of them, is a kind of a diminishment of variance right around midnight. It goes, ooh, uh, it's a V shape that is a little ragged some years, and a couple of years it goes the other way. But uh, uh, the average is a kind of nice confirmation that uh, the prediction that we would see a lowering of this variance measure, device variance measure, at midnight or leading up to midnight. 
we've seen that same kind of thing in other situations too, but that's another matter. But, and, um, well, I'll let you go ahead with that. Well, I, yeah, I think, no, again, I think that's, I think that's wonderful because, you know, the, the news events have this relatively unpredictable nature to them, right? And, and so that, that carries through in the data to some degree. But when you do have these regular recurring events, right, then, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're able to kind of look at that and say, okay, you know, at midnight, we can expect to see something, you know, yeah. and, and you can kind of build from there and potentially even use that again, to, to baseline. It's okay, if we're seeing this, then maybe we can use this to offer insights into the, the, the random spontaneous events that happen as yeah. well. Right. Um New Year's is kind of ideal because it's an abstract thing and it does have this point in time that's very precise, uh, even though you have to stack up all the time zones in order to look at all the midnights together, right? <clears throat> but there are things like um, the Kumela in India. It's a huge um, gathering of Hindus in northern India and to bathe away their sins in the Gandhi. Uh, that doesn't happen every year. It happens every 12 years in a big version and in between they have some and one or two smaller ones we've looked at four of those and they're the best um picture of replication uh, that i have in the database each of these four that we've looked at goes up, 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 like that so much so that by uh, and they all reach uh, significance by themselves and when you add them all together become even more impressive. It's like a thousand to one odds against chance that you should have that much consistent deviation during this religious holiday. I've tried looking at the Mecca gatherings, the Hajj, and, and it, unfortunately that has not been an, an easy thing because I think each time I looked, about three times, there was an, <laughs> the Hajj as a religious celebration was taken over by some tragedy. Like mm -hmm. one time I, they were building something or repairing something. They had a huge scaffolding fall on the crowd, killing lots of people and causing panic and that killing even more people and so on. <clears throat> so we do the best we can to, to find repeat, repeated events. But we, uh, ultimately the whole experiment kind of re replication thing where you say, I've, um, I've got a, a hypothesis, I want to test it, but I can't just test it once, I've got to test it many times. And that hypothesis is very general, and um, it only gets instantiated in, in simple and simple version. The general hypothesis is we expect to see deviations from randomness, correlations among the devices during events that bring huge numbers of people millions in many cases together in the same kind of emotional framework so they are synchronized by the uh, timing of events in the world in their thoughts and emotions yeah yeah well so another thing that i did want to ask was and this this might be a little bit out there but i wanted to satisfy the it crowd um Recently, the simulation hypothesis has been coming more into vogue, right? Which is, you know, that that basically we're living in the matrix. Maybe there's some higher level reality. Do you think that GCP might support that, or or do you think that the simulation hypothesis was just more likely to be wishful thinking based on today's technology? Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's I have to be careful here because I'm not a uh, I'm, I'm not a um, futurist, but I kind of think that uh, what the simulation hypothesis uh, amounts to, most of, the, most of what I know about it, seems like um, a, a wonderful current day fantasy program. If, if you see what I mean, in 10 years, it will be so different that it won't even have the same name. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Just as, you know, AI is... Uh, has become, has become the darling in uh, tech uh, very recently, in the last couple of months, with chat GPT, GTP, whatever. I've tried asking some questions like, how the hell are we going to learn to talk to people on the other side of the fence? And chat GPT 
uh, produces a whole litany of very, very fine ideas that we already have. That we already know. Treat people nicely. <laughs> yeah. Ask instead of uh, shouting at people. You know, talk instead of beating up on people. Love instead of hate. <laughs> it's all true. <clears throat> so I don't know if that, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer, but I honestly don't think that the GDCP data um, can have very much bearing on um, the simulation hypothesis. In a way, it's kind of, I think, inconsistent with the simulation notion because it uh, apparently depends on human consciousness and, and emotions. Hmm. The kind of things that don't, I mean, you, with a, the problem with something like that, in my mind, with um, a lot of hypotheses that uh, are of that nature, is that you can make up whatever you want. You know, it's like unfalsifiable. There, is there any kind of test that you can make that would prove to somebody who really believes that we're in a simulation uh, that we are not? I don't think so. But there are lots of um, bits and pieces of evidence, I think, accumulate to say we're, we're organic uh, beings that uh, are created by evolution out of basically dead particles. You know, it, I could, would recommend The Phenomenon of Man, which is a book written by Teilhard de Chardin um, to people who are you know, thinking about the simulation hypothesis. They, they, many would not want to try to read it because it's just poetry. It's just beautiful description of how evolution um, happened. It, and written by a Jesuit priest who's also a paleontologist and, and discoverer of taking man. So anyway, he said he he goes through this, um, you know, the description of things joining together and becoming more complex until they become alive, and then they become uh, more complicated and they walk the earth, and then they become us. And we think we're the pinnacle of evolution, but they are the short answers. No. No, not quite. There's more to do. We are uh, looking at another stage, and we can hope we will uh, have a chance to um, to engage and become uh, this new, you know, the next layer of the, the next version of the evolved human, which is to be part of the global consciousness, literally, to become part of what. Um, Notice what uh, Teilhard de Chardin called the noosphere, a layer of um, intelligence for the Earth, like an atmosphere, but it's made of knowing. Hmm. How about it? It's made of information. <laughs> well, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, it has been a tremendous honor and incredibly insightful to be able to interview you on this. So. In terms of how people can help reach that next stage, you had mentioned that they can download and play with the data all they like. Another mm -hmm. thing that they can do is get involved with the GCP project. And you talked about GCP 2.0, right? And so, yeah. um, I, again, I will put links up to that. But uh, do you think you might be able to close this out by describing a little bit about how and why people should get involved, how they can help support this going forward? and just help keep the science moving forward as well. Right. And GCP 2.0 is a bigger and better, or at least I think I uh, wrote it in a note, that it's bigger and better. You know, it's really heavy duty. Instead of 70 uh, nodes in a network, it will have a thousand. And each of those will have multiple random number generators. And each of those, um, not all of those will be um, Condition random, you know, XOR, super duper clean random stuff. Some of some of that uh, of the data that we ship up for later analysis and understanding will be the raw noise from these diodes uh, from the electron electron tunneling process. Hmm. So um, a thousand of them um, means that there we uh, our group of a dozen is not enough to host all of those. So we are looking for citizen scientists who will uh, 
actually they'll need uh, in most cases to purchase the uh, a device um, which will help support the project and then um, you know promise to plug it into their um, ethernet porch you know, is basically takes care of itself after that so um, we want citizen scientists not only to host the devices but to pull down the data do analysis to suggest questions that we really should ask all of those kinds of things that really are important to science the question once asked is soon answered you know but uh, that's our most important task um it's well along there's i think uh, the uh, current network size is something like 30 and it's in a testing phase to make sure everything's working to do the analysis, of all this complex data that's coming in, and so on. So people can go to gcp2.net, N-E-T, and uh, get more information on that. The, uh, I'm not sure whether that is yet the full, the full website is still in development, but uh, you'll be able to find a lot of that, that website already there. So and what people really can do is love each other. You know, people can, um, you know, I, I talked about it a little bit, but there, there's an attitude you can take, you know. We can, we had a sign, um, a kind of poster, but it was only on the side of the postcard in the pair lab at Princeton. It said, if we all work together, we can totally subvert the system. Well, on that note, let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, Tim. It's been a great pleasure.